and good evening and welcome to this evening's Bunker Show. Uh, this evening is the, uh, the day before the general election and we're deep here underneath the sewers of Westminster in our bunker getting uh, some of the, uh, the best people with uh, their feet on the ground to give us uh, some of the best reports that they can from what's really going on uh, around the country. But before we meet our guests, um, here's uh, my co-host, Jimmy. Yeah, good evening here live from the bunker. I hope everybody is well and happy and uh, weathering the election storm. And also with me in the bunker on comms and in the chat room, if anybody wants to communicate direct with us at the uh, Westminster bunker here on Dark City Radio, is the lady with the big silly grin. Here's Helen. Evening, guys. Looking forward to the show. Uh, jump in the chat room and join me. It gets lonely otherwise. And uh, without further ado, we're joined by a, a couple of fantastic guests this evening. Um, they're the kind of people that you trust with your lives. Uh, Michael Doherty is a, an, air, a, an aircraft engineer, is, is where his background comes from. Mm-hmm. And the uh, Westminster Bunk here on Dark City Radio is the lady with the big silly grin. Here's Helen. Evening, guys. Looking forward to the show. Uh, jump in the chat room and join me. It gets lonely otherwise. And uh, without further ado, we're joined by a, a couple of fantastic guests this evening. Um, they're the kind of people that you trust with your lives. Uh, Michael Doherty is a, an, air, a, an aircraft engineer, is, is where his background comes from. And the uh, Westminster Bunker here on Dark City Radio is the lady with the big silly green. We seem to have some kind of loop on at the moment. I think we're clear. We've been hacked. We've been hacked, people. Oh... Well, should be, start, should be started out now. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll persist. I was just going to say, um, they're the kind of people, I guess, that you trust with your lives. Michael, his background is in aircraft engineering. So he's the kind of guy that will make sure your aircraft is in one piece before you take off. And Darius, is, his background is as an airline pilot. Uh, so he's the kind of guy that you'd trust to make sure that aircraft gets on the gr- up off the ground and I back down again. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, it's, they're both standing uh, for election tomorrow. And mm-hmm. I'd like, to, I'd like to, to, uh, to ask them, you know, why they wanted to stand for election, how their hustings were and how the media coverage was. As, so Michael, as, I'm air, as, I, as I'm an aircraft engineer uh, and I keep people like Darius flying, is Darius standing tomorrow? I am indeed. I will let Darius take the lead on uh, his views and I'll come back to you in five minutes, yeah? I'll listen to Darius. Certainly. Go ahead, Cap- go ahead Captain. <laughs> oh. Okay, it's the pilot in the, in the, in the driving seat. And Darius, you, you, you've got uh, also a background in renewables and meteorology, and um, uh, you've also uh, uh, done random acts of kindness in the locality as well. So, Darius, can you... What, 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 why am I standing? Yeah. Why am I standing? Oh, a very brief rundown. Um, I've never really been too bothered with politics and all that bullshit that goes on up there. Um, started getting a little bit rattled uh, probably when New Labour came in uh, and realising, hello, it's Tory you know, all over again. And it was really, what, two and a half, three years ago with this bastard lot, sorry, excuse me, this horrible lot that came in, the Tories, and my utter disdain for how the system is working, because it's not working for the people. I guess it was the the fracking at Bulkham that really stuck a rocket up my backside, you know, and I started peeling back the lies, thinking, this cannot be right. This cannot be right. Our government is supposed to be looking after us. And that was the big, hello? No, they're not, you know. So as I started peeling back the layers, doing research and just realising, 
Oh, my God, you know, what a crock of crap we're living in. Um, I, I guess that's what really got me motivated. And it was really... Uh, I've always really been more, uh, an, an anarchist, if you like it, but I realised that... I, I, I don't see any revolution coming soon, so um got to do something about it. So it was a few months ago, I just thought, well, I've got three little kids. I do not like what is going on, one bit whatsoever. I don't see anybody else really doing anything about it. Green Party aligns closest with my thoughts and feelings. Can't say I agree with everything. Um, personally, myself, where I live, standing as an independent isn't really an option. Um, so I felt, you know, Green Party aligns with my views for the sake of my kids, for the future generations. It's time to get in there and do something about it. And the only way to do anything about it, as far as I could see, is to climb inside the belly of the beast, or at least have a go at it. That's where I'm coming from. Okay, and Ferris, you mentioned um, that, that uh, the Green Party don't ally with you in every in every way. Um, do you think that uh, you have a voice uh, within that? Do you think it's a, a responsive party? Because uh, sometimes the accusation can be that uh, some of the mainstream parties, um, they, they, they're not responsive to their membership. I mean, the Liberals were very proud at one time that uh, their conference made up their policy. And that's since changed, since they've gone into government. Um, so they're no longer as responsive to their membership. And do you think that actually within the Green Party that that's um, more of a, a, a grassroots-led organisation? Most or definitely. Most definitely, without a doubt. It is. It's... it's it's, it's, it's pretty much it's, it's direct democracy, as close as you can get to it. You know, the, the, the policies and what have you, that it's made by the members and it goes up. It, 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 it's not made in a conference room and where, you know, it's then cherry picks as to who's lobbied against, you know, for what have you. Um, it, it, it's from, you know, bottom level up. It's, it's the people who come together, who put it together, who put it up. Um, uh, you know, it, it's the whole thing. It's like Natalie Bennett. She's not the leader. She's the spokesperson for the party. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's trying to get around, do away with this whole thing of a leader and, you know, a, a certain elite at the top of the party who decide what goes on. This is what is wrong. And this is why I believe Green Party is the way forward for myself, certainly for the time being. That's where I'm coming from with it. Um, I, I don't see any other way to qu to affect change any quicker, really. I would love to see a revolution, but I don't see it. St who's going to start it? Come on. <laughs> I don't see the revolution starting. <laughs> Darius, you haven't been watching my cases, then. <laughs> One man revolution. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's uh, Michael because you've done a, a lot in terms of, of getting up off the ground. I know I know Darius has. I know he's been a, a, a great support to me in, in in lots of ways personally. As have have you yourself giving me advice and also inspiration from 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 both of you. Um, Bruce, I hope that um, wasn't a pun about getting off the ground. As an engineer, I'm always firmly on the ground. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I was going to ask um, uh, both of you, you know, how have you found it being on the ground as, as an independent in, uh, in, in Ryslip and, and uh, Hilling? Well, I don't know if you saw like, a little bit of press. Ryslip and Uxbridge, bit. sorry. U Uxbridge and Ryslip South. It's an awfully posh, uh, urban area of London. Uh, I, I grew up there, actually, and a uh, lovely place in many ways. Uh, I moved out of the area when I started to face police corruption in the area in Hillenden Borough. Um, I, it is a thoroughly corrupt cesspit in terms of uh, local government, um, probably like most places around the country. And um, my journey over the last six years has uh, brought me to this particular point where I've put my hat in the ring in, in the Uxbridge and South Ryslip or in Ryslip South constituency. Why did I do it? Yeah. Um, yeah. A bit like a bit like um, our captain friend. Um, I did. I, I'm not really particularly interested in getting into getting into. Par oh, I'm not interested in getting into parliament. I think the whole place it has been proven to be. Uh, certainly in my lifetime, and I'm 44 this year. In my lifetime, I've seen uh, certainly massive broken promises. 
um, a Labour government that came to power on a sort of uh, wave of euphoria, a little bit like Obama, where people were thinking real change was going to come into place. And what I then saw through the Tony Blair years is uh, unlawful wars taking this country um, to faraway places on missions which were, you know, contrived to say the least. Um, we've still got Ch Dulcock inquiry, which is supposed to have been reported, uh, I think it was 18 months ago, it was supposed to be reported, it's clearly been held off until after this election, where there's questions about why this country was taken to war on lies, uh, into unlawful wars. And that's that, that Tony Blair, for me, um, I, I th think I was sort of probably traditionally, you know, probably like most people, you, you sort of uh, assigned a party at, at, at birth sort of thing, where I'd be, oh, I'm traditionally Labour or something like that. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, the, these people have uh, so much, you know, lied to the electorate and uh, pretty much systematically both parties. I mean, the, the Labour are saying that they, you know, they're, they're the party, still the party of the working class, of the people of this country. They, they've destroyed this country through the Blair years. Uh, any, uh, in as much as the Tories have over their term. So I, I don't really see any distinction between those two main parties. I, I, I do get, uh, you know, where, I forget his name, the last speaker was saying about, Darius was speaking nope. about uh, the Green Party and, and um, that the party's more democratic in that its members determine its um, manifestos. Um, but the Green Party still... Uh, it's still fringe, really, in terms of politics. So I stood as an independent, okay, because I really do think, I mean, part of my strap line have been, uh, has been about kicking the parties out of politics. You doesn't matter whether there's a good MP, uh, whether he's a good man or not, because once he gets in there and they, they get the party whip system onto them, they're just mm -hmm. all voting, like, in blanket votes, for whatever it may be. Now, I will say that, uh, and um, forgive me for saying so, but, John Randall, who was the former MP in Hillingdon, a uh, very good man, conservative, was the, in the end, he was the deputy chief whip of the Conservative Party. And I'll tell you the exact reason why I stood in the Uxbridge constituency is because John Randall, just like I did, faced police corruption. It was police corruption that destroyed John Randall's political career. Because I don't know if your listeners are, are aware, but John Randall was caught up in what was known as Plebgate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's Operation yeah. Alice. Is that right? All of that. Yeah. So John Randall was approached by uh, Keith Wallace, who lied to him and told him he wasn't a police officer, that he was a tourist. He was outside the gates of Downing Street, and he saw Andrew Mitchell calling that um, police officer uh, Tubby Rowland or Toby Rowland, sorry, um, a pleb. It then materialises that that wasn't true. Now, Randall had gone sort of behind the chief whip, Andrew Mitchell's back to Cameron, uh, hence why the whip was taken off Andrew Mitchell and obviously destroyed his career too in the, mean, in the meantime. Uh, it was only Channel 4 exposure that showed that, that, that Keith Wallace was an officer, a police officer. Now, John Randall hasn't said it. He's been knighted now and he's, in part, he's, he's, he's pr probably going to head destined off to the Lords at some point. But... He hasn't said that he stood down after 19 years serving his community in Hillington because of Plebgate. But I'm, I, I personally am 100% sure that's exactly why, because he's lost favour within certain factions within the Conservative Party. And they flew, obviously, Boris Johnson into the area. Now, yeah. Boris Johnson has had a personal hand in my case. So if... Just for your listeners, just to give a little recap about yeah, what it if you is. Could, like. If you could give a, a little recap of very, the... very quickly recap. What it, what I mean, it, in two thousand and eight, I discovered my. I, I was raising my four, my my daughter myself. Yeah, from about the age of seven, through to about fourteen and a half, I had uh, sole residency, which was given to me during when I got divorced uh, and from her mother, and um, which is again pretty extraordinary thing. Anyway, for uh, I, I did that court my case myself. I saw straight away. Uh, sisters and everything it was a very odd and i thought i could do this better myself so i just did it myself i'm an aircraft engineer i know aircraft systems this legal systems uh very simple in some respects and compared to what i already study now so i did it myself that was all good and well when she was 14 and a half i discovered she was being groomed sexually groomed online okay um obviously happens to lots of kids these days 
very, very serious, very serious material. Trying to meet her in hotels, very highly sexually explicit. Trying to get videos from her and photographs and all of that stuff. And it wasn't just my daughter; it was other children. I could uh, even I could identify from the conversations that I found. Okay, yeah, it's um, very serious and disturbing. Very serious. And when I reported to the Metropolitan Police, they did nothing. So two weeks later, I called back up to the to Hillingdon Police and um, try and get engagement from senior officers as to what's going on. The police's response to that was to raid my home on the fourth of September, two thousand and eight unlawfully i mean proven now unlawfully raided my home yeah with a battering ram 11 police officers dragged me naked in handcuffs from from my home uh, in front of full view of my neighbors yeah so obviously just maximum maximum humiliation maximum harassment yeah, yeah. Uh, and on, on allegations that i'd harassed the borough commander's secretary over the phone unfortunately for them these people i'd recorded the conversations with them okay now this then starts my journey in, into police corruption and uh, dealing with it. Now, I, I sort of came from the perspective of Brian that, that the police were OK. Uh, and now I found, uh, you know, from dealing with them, from dealing with the system, with the police watchdog. Uh, and not only, you know, all of these accountability systems in this country, it doesn't matter if you go to, you know, the, the, the health service, the, the financial services, uh, your council ombudsmen, the parliamentary ombudsmen, they are all there, and there's no question about it. They're all there geared to protecting the establishment, to protecting the state. Now, six, so, so it goes into the IPCC after I'm acquitted at trial when the tapes are produced to show complete and utter nonsense that I didn't do what they said. Uh, it goes into the IPCC. A year later, it, does a, it was a managed investigation, so one of only about 70 a year, um, they, one year later, they didn't even do a criminal investigation and they just say it was, it was all just a mistake. So what I did differently was I took the same material, the same evidence, and I put it before the criminal courts and I started a constitutional right of private criminal prosecution. I got the summons issued. It went into the Crown Court. Um, during the Crown Court case, uh, the evidence against these, this, this, it was a, the secretary who was on trial in that particular case was called compelling by the trial judge. Whoa. The same evidence that the IPCC didn't even start an investigation. Now, coming back to Uxbridge, the mayor's office, the uh, mayor's office of police and crime, MOPAC, which is the, the, the embodiment of the mayor in London in terms of uh, a police and crime commissioner for the Metropolitan Police. Mm -hmm. So Boris, Boris Johnson signed off £60,000 of funding, legal funding, to fund the defence of the police secretary in Hillingdon. At the so same that's time, tax, is that that's sixty thousand of taxpayers' money. This spent. Is for, yep, for legal defence. So the, at absolute, so the the hypocrisy and uh, of the whole thing. You've got a Tory government which is stripping legal aid across the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't get legal aid anymore. So you, ca I mean, clearly one tenant of any fair system of criminal justice. Or, is that the, the right to a fair trial. But the defence yeah. has no fair, right to a fair trial now because they won't be funded. So criminal defence lawyers, uh, whatever people think about them, they're being, they're being given absolutely... I mean, let's just talk about it, about food. Yeah, is the, you know, the defence lawyers aren't going to be being fed very well, are they, when they're on a £100 a day, if that, for yeah. doing a case. And they've got big workloads because they've got to do massive volume to try and make the money for defence lawyers, they're on a pittance if you even get legal aid these days. So yeah, and the latest, the latest figures that I've got is one in five uh, people in a magistrate's court are litigants in person, which kind of yes. implies that they're not able to get the support that uh, is available to people if they have the money. Correct. I mean that. That's. I mean even the the law society, not law society. Uh, the, the the lawyers now have. Um, I think it's called uh, the. Uh, they've they've set up some legal aid. Um, clearly self and self-interest they want funding now um, they, they weren't doing too good a job I would say prior to legal aid being cut in terms of uh, I think it's a 98% conviction rate in the magistrate's court so really what was, they're not doing an awful good job there and I think it's about, it was about 70 something percent conviction rate in the crown courts now they are obviously saying that they're actually of course, saying, and there's some quite high-profile uh, criminal barristers who've come out and said that, that it is teetering on collapse, the criminal justice system. And 
partly what you're saying is because there's an awful lot of litigants in person. Personally, I would say litigant in person in some ways isn't so bad if you're capable and able to negotiate and um, navigate their system. I mean, I've done it myself. Uh, I was found guilty, as you know, of the stitch up in Stevenage. Uh, the, I'm the, uh, apparently the only person in the, in the land who's been convicted of assaulting a designated court security officer in a farcical case when it was, of course, me being assaulted. But uh, and that was again, you, you, you uh, it, it was recording that helped you out there as well. I'm, I'm, I'm a great advocate of if you engage with official dim, is to it, engage um, uh, with, uh, with recording equipment to keep yourself and everybody else safe. No, no, no. I, I, I agree. I agree entirely. The um, stitch up in Steven, it was. Uh, you know, we talk about immigration. Uh, immigration has been a massive issue in the um, election, this election, okay? Now, the case which led to Stitch Up and Stevenage was the fact that I was taking papers for in relation to a Metropolitan Police informant, okay? Uh, mm-hmm. A man who is alleged, and I've seen some of the evidence, uh, to a girl, um, uh, a man who, who bottled another man in the face in the nightclub, uh, a man who was proven illegal immigrant, a man uh, proven went to jail for £25,000 worth of benefit fraud because he was um, still claiming his father's pension after he was dead for over two years. Now, I took the papers in relation to his immigration fraud. So this guy was very much protected by the Metropolitan Police. I took the papers to Cambridge Magistrates Court in relation to that immigration fraud. Absolutely bang to rights proven. Um, the court in that occasion refused to take the papers off me. You still hear me, can you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they refused to take the papers off me. And this is the, the, the incident when I call, asked to speak to the manager. I'm always polite. I asked to speak to the manager. The next thing I'm being is uh, security all being called and I'm being handled out of the building, yeah, for absolutely no reason whatsoever. I'm doing exercising you know, our right to uh, lay information in the court. All I was wanting to do was hand papers over to the court. And they were refusing to take them. One wonders why. Um, that particular case was actually supported by QCs. The cases I do um, are supported by QCs, indeed. And um, I won't bother mentioning his name, but the the, the prosecuting um, barrister uh, it was a Crown Court recorder, okay? Who. Mm-hmm. Get, me, get me some. Anything, anything. Sorry? Sorry, I'm just, talk, I'm just talking to someone else. So, so. That's supported by a QC, okay? What happened in that case? CPS came along, took over the case, applied their what's called Code for Crown Prosecutors, and um, what they said in it is that, that the case meets the evidential sufficiency test. Basically, it was banged to rights. So it, it passed the, that, that test. They then said on the public interest test that they're not going to go ahead with the case because the CPS claimed that Justice Now was not a Minister of Justice. And then they came in, took over the case and stopped the case. Now, clearly, that begs the question uh, whether they whether they're correct or not about Justice Now's motives for doing whatever they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they take it? Why didn't they continue with the prosecution? Well, the CPS are quite well known for uh, taking over Mm -hmm. hijacking cases and then and then closing them, closing them down. And so was that was that part of the reason why you wanted to stand was um, because Boris Johnson had had actually um, backed public officials with public money to answer for their actions. Well, but I mean, there you go. I mean, this this is the situation. You're you're getting people across the country, innocent people who are being persecuted by the police uh, or persecuted by the state. You can't call it anything else but persecution. Yeah. the, I mean, all of this will all come out, and there's plenty more on my journey to be going. There's lots of very, very big things in the horizon, but and, and you can only call it persecution. I'm not. When I started on this, one of my main motivators and drivers is that if this is happening to me, okay, it's happening to other people, and that's that's a that's a thought I've had, you know, from the very beginning of all of this. And if I don't stand up, then if I don't stand up. They'll just continue doing it to other people, okay? And as, of course, over the last six, seven years, of course, I found very many victims of exactly the same thing. You stand up to them, they're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks and try and destroy you. But yeah, that it's, all, all, 
I, I was going to say, it, I, 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 it's almost like bureaucratic stalking. Um, it, I, I mean, I've got friends all over the world now, and certainly uh, I've got a lot of friends in Eastern Europe who lived through the communist times, in some of them in very high positions within the, the, the system. And from when I have my conversations with various people, um, one of them uh, said, that sounds to me just exactly what would happen where, during communist times, yeah? During communist times, they'd just pick your life apart. They'd just come at you from every different direction. You know how they're connected, but they're connected, and they will come for you, and they will try and pick your life apart. But one thing I will say is, again, partly you're, my, you, you're saying, Fabrice, is about inspiration for doing it, yeah? I mean, I've, come, I've, I've done six cr private criminal prosecutions against them. I've won a high court defamation case against a senior commander in the Metropolitan Police. Um, I've won a high court uh, judicial review against the CPS. Put Bishop John Arnold under an injunction, which continues to this day, and the Diocese of Westminster. Uh, that's just a little uh, parliamentary and, ombudsman decision against the council for unlawful and acts. Was, and, and, and that was um, for covering up evidence, and, and that was for well, Bishop John Arnold, looking after Bishop your children. John well, Bishop right? John Arnold, let me tell you about Bishop John Arnold very, very quickly. Bishop John Arnold, um, uh, there's, a, there's a whole load of stuff going on, and it relates back to my daughter's school, okay? Um, there's no need to go in particularly into detail, but some things happened in my daughter's school around all of, all of this stuff's happening, some stuff happened to my daughter. Now, uh, Bishop John Arnold got a data protection request. In fact, I, I, I met him. I mean, there's absolute proof that the school was lying through their teeth about some things, yeah? And um, again, for a brief, it was quite interesting. It was a recording that proves it, yeah? And uh, Bishop John Arnold tried to say, well, no, it's nothing to do with me. I'm not getting involved. It's only the school and the school, blah, 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 say everything's okay. Now, what I said to Bishop John Arnold is, of course, he was involved because he sent a lawyer from the diocese to the school governor's meeting. And it was their lawyer who called the governor's meeting to a close when the tape recording was produced. So you're very much involved. So he says, okay, I'll meet you. I meet him, I play the tape to him. He agrees with me. He says, I'm going to do an investigation. Two months later, he says, it's all been done. The investigation's all cool. I said, okay, who did the investigation? I'm not telling you. I said, okay, can I have, a, can I have the written report for them? There wasn't a written report. It was given to me verbally. I said, okay, no problem. So I fired a data protection request into the diocese. The data protection is, is quite staggering. Bear in mind, this man is a trained barrister from Oxford University. He e he emailed me the, um, an email. And in the email, he says that he has evidence in relation to uh, the, or data that should be disclosed to me, but that he's not going to give it to me because uh, I'm going to litigate against them. And if, as he's no more use for it, he's going to destroy it. Okay? That's in an email. And, so that, and that, that, again, if that's an arch, uh, sorry, a bishop doing that losing losing files or trying to lose yeah, files I mean, yeah, yeah, you know you've, you've given quite a few examples of of that happening you know when i was uh, i'm a similar age to you michael when i was younger um we they, we when a minister didn't do their job um they would be fired uh, or they would have pressure on them to resign Absolutely. and in in terms of of lost files and you know some of the organizations that you've mentioned they all seem to be Theresa May's responsibility um, and it, it seems that no matter how a minister does I mean you mentioned the IPCC not being uh, fit for purpose um, the child sexual abuse inquiry um, the, 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 it hasn't got off the ground G4S contracts that are fraudulent um, lost files, um, and that that's one department. Um, and I think that that you know, with with people standing up against, I mean, Boris Johnson, who you're standing against, uh, there's a recording of him talking to a friend of his, Darius Guppy, uh, discussing beating up a journalist. Oh, man should, and, be, should have been prosecuted for trying to arrange the assault of a journalist in this country. Yes. Yeah. Yet yeah, there's a man standing standing for Parliament in Uxbridge. He's not fit and proper to be standing in Parliament. He was he was ousted from from his last day uh, role as MP in Henley because he lied to the party chair about him having an affair. When that was discovered, he he stepped down from Henley. Mm. I mean, it, I, 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 
I'd be interested to hear from 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 Darius why why he chose the the Green Party um, to, to to fight against that establishment um, block, if you like, um, because. Uh, it seems, as, as we mentioned earlier, all three of the, the mainstream parties, um, well, they've, they've presided over the wealth gap increasing between the rich and the poor. I don't think we voted for that. Social mobility, the, 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 how hard it is to own your own home or to make a life for yourself. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, blowing a big hole in the desert in, in wars that... that were expensive, unpopular, and if you look at the state of Libya, not effective. So, because I know, Darius, you're in, you're in the Tory heartlands, aren't you? Massively. Where I live, it has always been Tory. It has been nothing else but Tory. <coughs> Sorry, do excuse me. And it's time for change. Um, I've never seen anything like it in my area of West Sussex. There is a green person standing in every single ward and constituency, if you like it, which is absolutely brilliant. And I think that speaks absolute heaps and volumes and volumes. Um, to go back to what you're saying, where am I coming from? Why the Green Party? If I, I'm going to try and do it as quickly as possible. Um, a friend made a very interesting point, and he was right. Uh, when I was a, a kid, um, I went to a private school. Now, at the time, my father wasn't around. My mother had to work three menial jobs to get me and my sister to said private school. In a little battered, beaten up Fiat 127, age 10, 11, 12. My first car. <laughs> but um, to where I'm going with this, this school was quite a small private school. And what I'm seeing, I can compare, I can see these private schools and the elitism there to exactly the same as what is going on in government. So you've got basically the headmaster and you, you've got the head boy, the head of house, if you like it. I, you can compare them to Cameron and Osborne, the head boys, if you like it. So there they are, little snitches, um, you know, snitching to the headmaster and the elite inner circle, call it the board of government governors, whatever, the top few parents, the really powerful parents who are putting their kids into schools, be it diplomats, be it government people, be it, be it whoever. These are people with serious, serious money, and they're the ones that get what they want. Whereas the, 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 right down at the bottom of the scale, the kids like myself and one or two others whose parents really had to work to get them to these schools, we did not benefit. We were not considered good enough to be treated as equals to a lot of the other kids that were there. And certainly a lot of bullying going on from the, the heads, if you like it, the, the, you know, the, 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 the prefects, the, uh, the head boy. They were just nasty, bloody bullies, much the same as what we're seeing in government. And going back to like two years ago, three years ago, I started to draw all these comparisons going back to my rubbish childhood at that bloody awful school, which was just... Oh, exactly the same model, if you like it, exactly the same model. So we're seeing these people in Parliament who all went to the very best schools with the very, very best backing, with ridiculous amounts of money, but they have no reality, which is just like how I can compare my, being at that certain school. A lot of the kids I was at school with, I had nothing in common with. They came from worlds where just... You know, they did not understand the concept of money because they didn't need to. You know, I had the piss taken out of me for being dropped off at school in a Fiat 127. A lot of them were boarders. A lot of them were turning up, you know, in rollers and all the rest of it. Um, it's... It, it, it brings us back to that whole power, the divide, the money at the top. Though you know, it goes up to the top. They're the ones who get what they want, and it's all players in it together. The, the elitism of Eton, Cameron, and Osborne, and even Miliband to a you know a, a certain degree. All these people that they, they, they have not done a hard day's work. They have not worked their way up one bit whatsoever. They are they, not they, much. I, I think they all went to the same class at school, um, didn't they? At uh, George Osborne, David Cameron, and Boris Johnson. Yeah, yeah. So, which, which kind of again, it, it, it makes it very hard for, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, that the wealth gap between the richest and the poorest keeps on increasing, and it seems less and less people have um, any. Uh, faith in the the media that's that's getting reported 
Um, have ha, have you found it in terms of the the response you're getting on the streets and from local media? Myself, it's been it hasn't been too bad at all. I've got the West Sussex County Times have been pretty good. They've been very good. They did a centre page spread on myself and three other Greens in the area when we signed the the Citizens Charter for transparency and to work for the people and all you know all that kind of thing. They ran a massive feature on it and they listed everybody who's running and standing, all those that had, and they listed those that hadn't. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, for, for pretty much what's always been a Tory paper, that was quite impressive, I've found. Um, also finding on the street an awful lot of encouragement. Um, what, the area I live in is predominantly farmland. There's a lot of uh, horsey types, you know, equine farms and... There's also a fair, a certain amount of your hunty types. Uh, we won't go there at the moment. That's something else altogether. And I was expecting an awful lot of slagging off, a lot of obstruction, a lot of bad mouthing. And to be completely honest, um, I've had nothing but encouragement. Um, so a guy who's on the local parish council. He's been Tory all of his life. Um, he saw me d down the lane the other day. I went to go and collect some eggs, and he was coming up the road, and he stopped me. He grabbed my hand, and he said, Bloody good luck for next week, my son. Good luck. I really wish you the best. And he went, I've always been a Tory all of my life, but I've had enough of this shower, and I think you are going to be very pleasantly surprised at the amount of support you get. My jaw hit the ground. It really, really did. So... I'm kind of feeling the love, you know. <laughs> so, hey, hey, hi, Darius. It's uh, Jimmy here. In, in a nutshell, what what would you say? What would you say? Uh, perhaps the top three reasons for this um, sudden um, surge of, let's say, interest in alternate parties to the to the major three. I would say certainly for my area, certainly for East Horsham area, it has, a lot of it has got to do with infrastructure and housing and this ridiculous rampage of build, 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 build. Everyone's against it. The amount of um, objections that have gone into Horsham District Council have been massive and ignored, and it's been whipped by the Tories. You will have it. It will go for it. Um, I've been using that as my main in with talking to people. I've been using things in sandwiches, and as you say, the, the threes. So I've been using housing, I've been using the second runway at Gatwick and I've also been using fracking which is rife around this area as many of you will know West Sussex they are really trying to have it on so out of the three things I can always find something that I can move across to to make a point and get something back from somebody um, it's been an interesting process learning how to speak to people without making them feel stupid by saying, but don't you know this? Don't you know that? I, f I found that an interesting process by using you know, the, th the three main things, sandwiches. I can sandwich other bites between them and then move across. If I see it's getting awkward and whoever I'm speaking to isn't happy about it, I can then sidestep it onto something that they perhaps do agree with. Once I've got them agreeing with me, I can then move it across to something a little bit more controversial and make points. Um, there's been an incident in my area where 200-year-old oak trees were just hacked down by a landowner who thinks he's, uh, you know, mightier than thou because he's a multi-millionaire. The, the, guy, the guy's a con man. I've got to be careful what I say. I can't name him or say where he is, but he, he might have something to do with local council. And uh, funny how he gets planning permission for whatever you like. Well, um, one, of the, one of the things with the Greens uh, I think is really interesting is the you know, anti-corruption stance. And you know, just over to Michael for a second. Um, with, with the election coming up, what, 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 what would you say are some of the well, let, things? Let, you've been let, let me say, let me, you, you just touched on the Greens and anti-corruption, okay? Now, Baroness Jenny Jones, and this is not down to you, this is down to me, and Jenny can sue me if she wants. Um, Jenny Jones, um, to her much, I'd say, disgrace, the defamation case in which I was which is just basically a police smear. Now, Jenny Jones wrote to the um, commissioner of the Metropolitan Police at the time, Sir Paul Stevens, um, off once an article called Weber Lies. You can see it on my uh, website, written by journalist of the year last year, Michael Gillard. Now, that article called the police, the IPCC, liars for covering up the grooming um, in my case. Jenny Jones took it up and um, as a obviously constituent part of the GLA, and she wrote to Paul Stephen asking for answers. 
the response yeah. to that came the response from that came from uh, a, commi- a commander in the Metropolitan Police to Jenny Jones in the form of an email. That email was the most scandalous, scurrilous um, attack on me personally with complete and utter lies. Yeah, obviously tailored to because obviously Jenny uh, does a lot of stuff for uh, women's rights and all of this sort of thing. Very tailored to turn her off supporting me. Now, Michael, I'm just sorry to interrupt, but um, I was just wondering, you know, would, would you say corruption would figure in your top three gripes that you've been hearing on the streets as far as you know, upco- upcoming I, I, um, I mean, attitudes towards so, the election? Yeah, certainly from, from what I can see, corruption is clearly a massive issue across the country. And it fits, so you're just talking about planning issues. The accountability, the lack of accountability, again, Fabrice talked about it just a moment ago, but people would resign. They would fall on their own sword when they're caught out. They'd at least have the, the, the grace to do that. It doesn't happen these days. They just do come after scandal after scandal. They continue in their ministerial posts. They come in and out of politics. They should be banished from politics. When they're shown to be unable to actually conduct themselves in a proper manner, they should be banished from public life. And it's about account, public accountability. There are many good police officers. There are many good politicians, many good councillors out there. So but there are many corrupt ones, and they are not being held to account. Accountability, obviously, breeds, allows, of course, people are going to be corrupt. It's a bit like a yellow line system. If there isn't any, I know people don't like parking tickets, but I guess there is some benefit from people not parking on double yellow lines. They might be there for a reason, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, was, so essentially transparency um, all the way from the top down you know, so everybody can see. Without question. Without yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and how do you feel about lobbying? You know, like is, that one, is that something you hear people uh, discuss you know, as far as the uh, concerns with the, the major three parties? I mean, I, I, I haven't heard. I don't think. See, I think people, uh, again, going back to Darish's uh, conversation there, uh, sort of the nimbyism, people are very concerned in Uxbridge about HS2, about the, the, the runways that may be coming at Heathrow Airport, um, those type of personal issues. And, and certainly the whole hustings in, in the Uxbridge area was steered towards those things. National scandals like child abuse cover-ups within Parliament, in Rotherham, in Oxford and across the country, um, from Northern Ireland, you know, the, the King Cora, all of these things, they don't seem to figure on uh, local politics. Yeah, well, they well, seem, well, people well, seem to. The sign was during the election campaign on 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 the child abuse issue has has been deafening. You know, like, um, has that frustrated you? Have you heard people on the street actually mentioning that as an issue? No. Nope. Yeah, I mean, I, the people I talk to, you know, as soon as you talk to them about it, yeah, people open up about it now, and I think I think it's, it has to be a very positive thing that people now prepared to talk about these very difficult issues about the abuse of children and how it's being covered up. So I think that's a massive hurdle that's, that's certainly been overcome now, that people are prepared to talk about it, they do realise it's going on, and that the, the, the police and the state are not doing anything about it. So uh, yeah. that's a positive thing. I, I certainly uh, think that... I was going to say, I think it's very encouraging that there are um, different groups that, that uh, support uh, people who've, who've, um, who investigate and support or, or have been victims of, of abuse um, or the cover-ups of them. And uh, it, it's also in terms of police and judicial accountability, it's nice to see there are more independent groups springing up that have a, a, a cause um, that, that they can all push towards um, from the ground up. And I know that you've, uh, you have justice now, uh, that, that is a, a great conduit for, for people with, with issues, uh, in that field. And I also know that the fracking movement has been very, very successful in having relatively small local groups around the country of people who are active in their community. And when they do need to put pressure on the system, uh, as has happened very effectively with the, the child abuse inquiry and with the, the, the roll back of the, the, the fracking boom that never happened, uh, which is looking more like a fracking bust all the time. So, um, it's, social, it's, it, it's, the, it's the era we're in now with social media. Social media is where it's at now, I, I certainly believe. 
the mainstreams following is lagging behind what people are talking about on social media. People have been talking about the child abuse scandals. All of that stuff's been there for years now on social media. And the crescendo, you know, they just couldn't ignore it anymore. So I guess they're trying to let the steam off some of those things that are going on. People are talking. People are seeing other people who are standing up on their own, taking on the state, the corrupt state and the corrupt individuals within the state. And I, and, I mean, part of what I hope from what I'm doing is that other people follow suit with what I'm doing. I, I think it depends where you're living as to what you can do and how far you can go with certain topics. I mean, myself in West Sussex, I can't just go straight in there on some of the massive topics such as the, the paedophile thing. Let me bring it back to what I was trying to talk about with the planning. That's how I get a big in there with people who are really close to stuff, the big farm owners, the, 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 the horsey people, if you like it, um, with, with some of the, the really crap things that have gone on with planning in this area which they're not happy about i then use that to ask them what they know about fracking and they kind of look puzzled as to why and i say well but surely you're concerned about your livestock and all the rest of that kind of thing how it's going to affect the cost of your five million pound stud and all the rest of it let alone your stock let alone your rich arabs horses that you're tending to and they really are generally surprised and i'll say go and look it up just look up what's happening to livestock in australia and in the United States. And I can then use that to link it to the Tory corruption in this area. And I'm going to bring that back to fracking again. Francis Maud the third, oops, sorry, excuse me. Um, when Quadrilla first put in their application to frack in Balkan, the objections were absolutely phenomenal, massive. Three days before that was due to close, Maud went over to his mate, Soames, from Mid-Sussex, basically said, this isn't going too well in Horsham because of the objections, and it was rushed through in three days as an emergency application, so there were no objections whatsoever because nobody knew it had been switched and moved to a different council. And I managed to get that in, and that's when these people really start listening. And it's only from isn't, there... Isn't, isn't this, the, 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 this abuse of the democratic process... Yeah. Well, these people ought to be being prosecuted for it. I mean, mm. this, is, this was clear to, I mean, what you're describing, if that happened, is mm. clear to circumvent objections in the local area. Yeah. So they'll, yeah. we see it in the courts all the time, moving cases from courts to courts, mm. delaying them. Yeah. And strange uh, journey. Them. If, if it, 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 it up. jumped ship a month ago. You know, a month before the elections, he jumps ship and they parachute something else in. And you think, well, why is that? What have you not lived up to? What of your obligations have you not done? What are people going to tear you apart for in the coming elections? So off goes Maud, no doubt, up to the Houses of Lords, and in they parachute this newbie that nobody wanted. Uh, yeah, it stinks. It really does. Accountability, well, there is none. And, well, I, certainly know, I certainly know even in the Conservative Party within Hillenden, they didn't not Boris Johnson either, mm. but of course they're giving him because they need him in. And there's a massive issue about Boris Johnson. I mean, on, the t on terms of the private prosecution, there has been a private prosecution attempted to be started against Boris Johnson for electoral fraud in Westminster Magistrates Court. Absolutely nothing to do with me. But you know, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that in 2011, since 2011, I've been banging on about private prosecutions. And I think private prosecutions is pretty pretty much in the minds of most people nowadays. People know about it. Yeah? Yeah, I definitely think that that's a, a, a fantastic way of, of um, uh, resisting and holding the establishment to account and being active in, in your community. A lot of people... Um, uh, we like to encourage people to stand up and, and take positive action in their in their community. Find the the, the people that are there to uh, enable the community to find a voice, as everybody has uh, different skills that they can share and support each other with. And so, it's uh, it, do you feel it's a worthwhile thing to do to uh, stand up and and get your voice heard in amongst the the, the sometimes. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, scripted uh, and and channeled mainstream. Let's take, let's media take, let's script. take Boris. Let's take. Well, you you were talking earlier on about Hustings. Let's talk about Hustings in Uxbridge. I mean, Hustings in Uxbridge has been. They have absolutely barred independents from standing on the Hustings panels. There's a there's a video online 
Um, there is uh, there's a newspaper article about it, about the questionable hustings, the first and only hustings that Boris Johnson attended. Boris Johnson, as, as everyone knows, is uh, well uh, versed in r- rattling off into areas he ought not to go and making massive gaffes. The, yeah. the yeah, hustings... That's I was say, so, so, so you, you weren't able to have a hustings with with Boris Johnson because I know I saw no. you with yeah, so um, so let me, with, let me explain uh, with a cardboard cutout of Boris Johnson. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so at, I put the cardboard at, cutout at hustings. We've only got a couple of minutes to go, Michael. So, yeah. Yes, just just very very quickly with with the Boris Johnson hustings. Boris, the first and only hustings that he attended in Uxbridge was scripted. They uh, only had questions submitted in advance. The uh, the chair of it selected the questions that would be asked of Boris. And I've got no doubt he had the questions in advance. And um, no independents were allowed to be on the panel at all. Uh, it was just a, 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 a you know, very sort of like cherry-picked set of questions. When, you know, there's, there's much more questions. Like, for example, how the hell can that man be a mayor of London, have juri- pan, ju- pan jurisdiction over um, planning, policing, environment, transport, arts across London and also be an MP in London at the same time. If you're a um, ceremonial position of, say, for example, high sheriff, you're not allowed to stand as an MP in the same area you're high sheriff. So how is it that the mayor of London is able to stand in the thing? You know, let's say, for example, one of the constituents has an issue with the mayor of London and goes to his MP to, for assistance in that. Yeah. What, what does Johnson? What does Johnson do? Put, uh, put on his MP hat. Yeah. Put on his mayor hat. Exactly. It's just it. it it's definitely not Massive transparent, and that's what I'm really, really reassured about. About having people like you and people like uh, Darius standing uh, uh, as as representatives for the people in their community. Over to Helen. Hey, it's been really great listening to you guys. Sorry I haven't contributed much. I'm suffering from a few dental issues. Um, but I just want to say uh, what I really like about both of you is that you, you saw something, you had an idea, you realized there was a gap there and you stood up and you took responsibility and you did it yourself rather than waiting for the next man to come along and do it. And I've heard that really strongly in everything you do. And I follow you both quite closely. And it's been uh, it's a real pleasure to see you um, going forward and the popularity that you've gained and I wish you all the luck tomorrow because uh, yeah, you're, the, you're the good guys and we want you in. In the words of Vanessa Vine, if you see a job, it's yours if you've got an idea, implement it Absolutely Get on with it <laughs> People Get Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. it's really inspirational stuff and you know, I just wanted to wish both and of you tomorrow, good luck tomorrow Yeah, yeah, yeah and, um, Tomorrow, it, 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 certainly Boris Johnson the Oxford constituency will be live they will be going to it live, I'll be there I've got my backstage pass and I'll be there up on the stand, Justice Now alongside Boris Johnson Mayor of London, it's going to be interesting. And, Get your uh, and, and have they have they taken odds or have they closed the book on who's going to be the best dressed person up there? I think that I definitely get that. I'll get the award for that. No problem. Hey. Tomorrow, bro. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to join us, Michael. Yeah, Hello. thanks, guys. And uh, Darius, thank you ever so much, and all the best tomorrow. Good luck, Darius. Cheers, and to you too, Michael. Brilliant. See you, see you in the house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> see you at the bar. Cheers. <laughs> okay. And thank you all ever so much for uh, joining us this evening. Thank you to Jimmy, my co-host. Yeah, thank you, guys. And we'll see you on the other side next week. And next week we'll be in the old Bailey bunker where we'll have one of the best and brightest legal minds who's been helping an awful lot of people uh, which is Bradley Knight, and also joining us once again will be our Ad- Adventures in Legal Land UK regular, the uh, very eloquent and uh, uh, logical and bright Vin James. And thank you all ever so much for joining us on the Bunker Show. Um, we'll be back next week, seven o'clock. Stick it on your calendar. Uh, All the best and have a good night. Have a wonderful election.